Guys, welcome to House of Experts, episode thirty-three. Uh, I am your host, Vibha Kagzi. Super excited to be here. Um, as you know, we started House of Experts as a platform to bring to you the journeys of several other experts, so that you can learn from their trials and triumphs. And my guest today is uh, one of the most special guests we've actually had. Uh, her resume is, has been giving me a complex since the morning. um this is not good for my self esteem at all sheta um so just quick yes. introduction uh sheta went to iit bombay did aerospace engineering if that's not enough she ended up topping up her engineering degree with an mba from harvard business school post which she worked at boston consulting group then with the future group and then with nike in shanghai and the us believe it or not uh post which she decided to let go of her life as a corporate slave and start her own entity uh, and i'm wondering if you're still slaving it out but that's what we're going to talk a little bit about uh, on the show so welcome sheta and uh, welcome to house of experts episode 33 how's it going for you i'm doing good thank you so much for having me thank you so much for the lovely intro and uh, very excited for our chat today all so right full uh, people as well Okay, super. All right. So, Sheeta, since we run an educational advisory, uh, you know, early education obviously starts from our families, right? So, if you could just flash back a little bit and talk to us about your just early years growing up, early childhood influences. What What was your childhood like? Yeah. So, I grew up in Agra, uh, the city of Taj Mahal, and almost uh, a kilometer away from the Taj. Uh, so, a hopeless romantic uh, would be uh, my overall love story story. Uh, but grew up there. My dad worked with the government, which meant uh, every four years he kept moving cities. Uh, started from Agra, then spent two years in Delhi, then moved to Bombay, then Pune, then Indore, then Calcutta, then Lucknow. And I think that has, and I, that was the time, and it feels uh, completely, you know, it baffles me that at the time there were no phones, uh, there were no internet. Uh, if you lose a friend in one place, you probably don't get them back till ten years later when Orkut came in. So that's uh, how I grew up. Uh, I was a very, very introverted. So, kid. so how many cities overall? How many cities growing up? So I lived in seven cities in India and uh, three cities, cities international. So ten cities wow. in total. And I so you you eleven you won't let <laughs> you won't let any city or country claim you, huh? You're just like I don't I don't belong here long enough, so you you can't claim me as yours. We're we're gonna claim you for the next sixty minutes and 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 have you here. So, um, all right. So lots of different cities, army background. Uh, any early influences of this sort of moving around and your dad in the army and. Tell us a bit about your mom. You know, you mentioned this to me, and I think it's super exciting. So, tell us about the whole parental angle and how did that influence your childhood? Yeah. So, my mom was a national level hockey player, uh, and she is a psychology major. Um, and my dad was uh, an IIT. And so, but it was interesting that uh, you know, families at that time. I growing up, I was a first child, very introverted, very very influenced with my dad. So I actually did not recognize for the longest time that how big a deal was that my mom was a national level hockey player. So my early influences did come from my dad looking up to my dad and uh, studying lots of maths and science. And slowly, uh, as I started my own journey into sports, I realized, oh my god, my mom is—I mean, she's talented. Mm-hmm. I mean, doing math. Psychology, uh, being a full-time mom, uh, being a hockey player, and she played Coco on the side too. So she's wow. Ex- <laughs> and those things started coming to me later in the life when I went to undergrad. Uh, but for the longest time, uh, it would surprise you that I did not like sports. I was an absolute nerd growing up. All I wanted to do, I had this mantra I had studied uh, that uh, you no know, Swami Ramakrishnan, he only slept for four hours a day, and then he would study, study, study. So I thought, you know, that's the oh, mantra. Yeah. 
So I would actually just study, 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 uh, and I would have very specific time where I would go and get my. I was very inspired by biographies. So any successful person, it says something interesting about working hard and having a routine life. That is what I tried to do. So that was me. I would have very strict intervals on when I would eat, how I would spend my day, study, study, wow. study, and uh, and that's how I was uh, till actually very interestingly uh, till and a whole journey was to get into IIT. because my okay. dad was so that that was the focus huh? you knew that only was, on that like, that okay. was the yeah I had like these posters stuck somewhere you know i have to do it i wanted to be air one like that was me oh uh, and i wanted to be an aerospace engineer because i had seen at, at, at what age did that happen at, at what age did this whole iit soon. fascination on starting 8th grade i know i, I remember grade. me studying for iit starting 9th grade i knew what it was my dad had told some beautiful stories about uh his life in it bhu and how beautiful the campuses are how amazing it is to study there and i thought you know i want to be there uh, uh -huh. so, but all that interestingly came shattering and i and i was doing well too uh you know i was first of my class and i was doing great in exams till 12 Uh, and i knew i think there was some sort of an overconfidence too which i just felt i could do it which all got shattered when i didn't actually gra uh, at, uh, clear iit in my first attempt oh really wow and okay I, that was a big turning point because up till now i thought there was a clear mantra you study hard study study you ignore everyone in your life uh, <laughs> i barely had friends i had never gone out for dinners with anyone and i it was all this about me and me being just this studious girl and when that did not happen i think it just sh uh, shattered some core belief uh, made me mm. super humble uh, also realized that life gives you all these kinds of ups and downs um i actually did ended up uh, joining um triple it kanpur and i was there for 6 days oh yeah oh really <laughs> I, okay yeah but somewhere there uh, it struck me that i want to give it another chance i called my dad he he said he without any questions asked he said come back home i studied by myself we were in calcutta we had just moved to calcutta so i just studied by myself uh and uh, i changed as a person i think we became more humble and understood uh, life a little more uh, i did clear it after that but uh, it, it wasn't like if i don't do it it would be end of the world or i'm mm. the most uh, egoistic person okay so actually that the iit training ended up being a big lesson huh more than it just was, the clearing an exam it was a big lesson in humility and you know it, it, there are more things that, that could go into making you achieve abc mm wow okay wow. I, i like that story no one's ever been so honest on the show and talked uh, you know immediately about a failure typically i have to ease someone into sharing a, a personal failure but uh, thank you for doing that thank you for that honest confession uh, it just makes makes the show more sort of human and relatable uh, because obviously we've all been through our share of failures um tell me about this whole fascination with aeroplanes where does this whole aerospace engineering come most of the iit kids i speak with end up you know saying hey i'm actually doing aerospace engineering and they look really dismal because they've been forced into it they all want to do computer science and when we spoke you said i knew i wanted aerospace engineering so what is that fascination about Yeah I think as I told you I was always fascinated with biographies and successful people so when I was growing up you always looked into women inspiring women who had done something great and I think and I was studying science uh, so at that time I think on TV the only person in the science and tech space was Kalpana Chawla and she I think that was the time in my growing years where she had just uh, you know uh, there were talks around she going into space and unfortunately the crash too but she was the person i could have somehow related to uh and uh, that struck to me uh, of course it sounded very complex and somewhere that it challenged me i said you know it's probably the most and i thought that was the toughest like that's my ignorance i also thought the toughest to get into iit is uh, aerospace i did not know it was computer science so that's how naive i was so i ah, thought I see. it is also the toughest so that's what i want and that's what an air one wanted uh later i realized no <laughs> it's uh that's not the case but i mean my fascination with the uh, aeroplanes uh was uh, somewhere just built and it continued and it continued okay all right so you cracked iit someone's asking which iit is iit bombay iit uh, bombay. okay uh how is iit bombay yeah world's crazy kitchen is iit bombay thank you for that question okay so how is iit bombay what is the experience like uh 
other than chetan bhagat's books and movies most of us have no experience uh, in these iit iim worlds tell, tell us your experience tell, tell us your candid sort of you know first hand experience yeah. at iit bombay yeah so i my experience is slightly tricky because i joined aerospace engineering and uh, my dad was always apprehensive that why do you want to do aerospace engineering there's so many other crafts it's difficult for girls don't do it i said no i don't want to do it and literally the first thing we found out uh, at the minute you hear the word difficult you're just like i'm going to do it i want to do it i think that's just me and that's been the theme of how i make a lot of decisions in my life shaza sending me 1 million dollars is really difficult how does that sound <laughs> i might just figure out the you want to do it in <laughs> million dollars and give you 1 million dollars <laughs> okay done done we're shaking hands on this right now this is a deal it's on air i've captured this shaita so there's no escaping huh yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay so, so and see the first thing my dad found and you have to like submit your uh, roll number like, literally on the entrance gate and he reads through the lines and he said you are the only girl in the class so it's oh, wow it's, uh, wow 40. This is twenty two thousand six, so you know, it's not eighties. So we talk about two thousand six, yeah. so forty, and I'm the only girl, and that's what. And imagine this: my dad. We don't live in Mumbai. I'm a nerd at this point, with no friends, and doesn't know how to talk to people. Uh, but <laughs> I think, with the grace of God, he's like, you know what, to start off. And I think that experience also changed me. Uh, sitting in a class, and IT was like that, where everyone's a nerd. not just me so no one knows how to talk to boys or girls of the opposite gender were you actually the only from woman in your class in, in my class engineering the engineering so we had a class wow. so in this class of 40 i was only girl uh, overall the ratio was we had a, at that time 550 was overall batch and there were 26 girls at that time so wow. of course overall also there weren't too many girls now the ratios are much better i right hear but uh, in university of course i was only one and that also shaped wow. me because Imagine sitting in a class where they don't know how to talk to me, and I had I had made this rule that I would just uh, because I realized no one was sitting next to me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, oh. oh important, really? I would just decide that I'll enter the class a little late, and whosoever guy I can figure out that the seat is empty, I would just go sit next to them and try to talk. And this was, I think, that also shaped me because before that I hadn't spoken to anyone, I didn't know how to talk. uh so uh, it also shaped me i guess in some shape or form uh plus uh, i got into sports then i realized mm. everyone smarter than i am uh and <laughs> so why not figure things out so i tried a lot of things i got into arts i got into sports i got into dancing and somehow realized that i like running uh and the coach saw me uh running uh you know in the morning by myself so he said why don't you come and train with me Mm-hmm. and uh, 3 years fast forward i uh, you know i led the entirety uh, athletics team uh, oh, wow. okay. 400 meters race so i think that just my genes of sports your started, mom's genetics yeah they started mom's genetics and you know uh, those started running in um and uh, i became more of an extroverted person i actually headed mood and go which is uh, it mom's cultural festival became the only first girl i mean after all of this girl became the first girl who headed the festival as an overall wow project. wow so uh, th- th- that okay, changed so iit sounds like a renaissance of sorts you know it, it changed your people who have met me before iit and after iit uh, know me as uh, two different people two different people oh wow okay look at the pictures you would laugh at my pic like how i looked <laughs> before and how i looked after Uh, I, oh, that's fine. Most of us have been through this sort of catharsis of how we looked earlier and how we look now, and we we'll probably laugh at the way we're looking currently as well. So, so, so that's okay. But lots of lessons coming in from IIT, huh? So the early lessons in in failure and sort of overconfidence, uh, moving towards humility, then the sports side kicking in, your mom's genes kicking in, and then you taking on these sort of front leadership roles and getting over your. the sort of reserved nature etc so it it sounds like quite a catharsis and sort of quite a metamorphosis um of sort huh yeah yeah it was a big change and uh, in hindsight i think these small uh, difficult situations made it so and i think that's the key point is uh, if i wasn't the only girl in the class if i wasn't if i hadn't got into iit the first attempt i wouldn't have become this person i think that's the attitude now. and of course i feel i will tell you the hp story i'll tell you why i even got there but I think all these stories have taught me uh, something, and it makes you a better person. So I just wanted to highlight those examples. Okay, terrific. I'm getting uh, applause from Rajalakshmi Valwalkar. Thank you, Rajalakshmi. 
I am a foodie guy. I'm from IIT Delhi, first year as well. Okay, awesome, you guys. IIT people giving all the rest of us a, a serious complex. Thank you, I'm foodie guy for adding to my complex this evening. Having Shweta as a guest here. So what what happens next? So you finish up at IIT and then is it BCG? What's what's the next sort of? I joined BCG. Milestone? I joined BCG. I joined them as a consultant. Uh, I was with their Mumbai office. Worked with them for two and a half years across uh, consumer, consumer tech. Did some due diligences. Uh, learned a lot of math, science, making fancy presentations, and uh, uh, high. Okay, so, 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 sort of demystify this whole consulting. You know, wh- what is the hype behind consulting? Uh, why do people want to do it? Why did you want to do it? And you know, does it live up to the hype? What What is this whole you know sort of consulting bubble? Yeah. uh why i want to do it two things one uh, at this point for me i had figured out that uh, i wasn't going to pursue aerospace engineering and consulting was promising this high flyer life oh you get to travel so much so i was like great at least i'll be close to aeroplanes i think that was ah. two all the smart people from the campus were going there so i thought why not uh, you know i should also go there and so three, the difficult word so comes back huh you're it's like tough. It's okay. difficult to go back to consult. Okay, I want to do that. It's the D I word. I want to do consulting. And third was, uh, of course, uh, generic. I think it led. Uh, it had the promise of you figuring it out and uh, delay the decision of what you want to do because up till now you only thought of engineering. And I wasn't in sure. computer science or uh, mechanical or chemical, which had a direct path. I needed some more time to figure out what I do and how I transition. So that's oh, how it. So what happened to the aerospace dream then? So how, where did that sort of fizzle out, and then sort of consulting came up? Yeah, two things. One, I realized that uh, if I wanted to continue it, I had to leave India right after. Uh, I had never, I mean, lived uh, uh, by myself abroad. Uh, I didn't have people there, and I just was feeling like, you know, what's wrong with India? Let me just stay here. But I knew I couldn't make a career out of it. Uh, I think that's where it fizzled, and I had started taking all these leadership positions. I had. you know or uh, did uh, spun things for the festival so i thought i want to like let's see the corporate life um, sure and i know then aerospace would lead me to be a scientist in one room and i want a team so that okay cool so that then that makes perfect sense so you go to consulting and how was it how was the experience so, you know what what do you what do you guys do as consultants and you know what is that whole life about yeah i mean honestly i wouldn't lie the first three months were tough it's <laughs> they uh they hire uh, people from um, good colleges because they feel they can they bring rigor but uh, imagine someone who has had fun for four years uh, the rigor is really difficult uh, what we uh, i think what consultant I, does- i love it when iit people say when when we had fun in college i'm just like do you have any idea what the rest of us were doing in college clearly you don't have any idea <laughs> It's like uh, the most competitive college in India, and you're like, hey, you know, we had all this fun on campus, and this. No, like, imagine so my guys. first case. I wouldn't lie, my first case. So I was the one who. So you were class of ten who got hired. I was the only one uh, who was unstaffed for two months. They couldn't figure out a case for me. So I go on these like fancy office parties, but I don't have a case. I got staffed a day before my birthday, and this oh. is the email oh. I get. Uh, the email says that for the next uh, three months. please tell your relatives and friends and family that you would not be available because we are working on this case with a client that we are getting for the first time is going to be really tough uh, so and this is like literally starts on my birthday uh, it goes on from 7 am till midnight and the next day i couldn't wake up on time because i was just so oh. hungry <laughs> oh. <laughs> not used to the regimens you are used to your own rules uh, here was regimens but uh, i i guess on a, a more serious note uh, what consulting did help and uh, uh, those three years were tough but i think it does teach you how to uh, break down a large problems into small small chunks so usually when they hire consultants uh, is uh, a big client has a big problem that they sometime might not have the time or resources uh, and sure. you that problem and break it down which each team member does it and you apply you use the data that they already own or you use the market data to then synthesize some information and present it back to the client i think that shapes your problem solving skills really well and it doesn't daunt you uh, when big problems come in the future it doesn't daunt you so i think that's the core skill skill set also you have to present that- your problems to someone who is the expert how do you do that and how do you learn that skill set uh, is also what consulting teaches you 
Of okay, course, fine. The presentations and the grand. Of course, sir. and of course, also the glamour of like the aeroplanes, the different locations, uh, hobnobbing with the sort point. of senior management, yeah. the points, the yeah. frequent flyer stuff, and uh, being you know at twenty two or twenty three, uh, you know, as like this young kid, you're sort of. Talking to CFOs and CEOs, so yeah, it's. I mean, it's it's beautiful. You feel, yeah, and you're advising my fancy clients. You're wearing all these <laughs> shoes. You know, <laughs> you feel really good. Sure. Okay. Uh, I'm foodie guy. You want tips for the next four years? Uh, I, I'm foodie guy. Not sure what sort of tips. If you could kindly just be a little more specific, uh, we'd be more than happy to take that question. Okay. So what happens next? So BCG happens, and where does Harvard for sort of Fall into place? Is it just because it's super difficult to get into Harvard Business School that that's why you wanted to go? So actually, the story started with so two. So I told you we had a class of ten, and uh, after so usually you do consulting for like three years and then do something else. That was what everyone in the class was doing. And uh, slowly, slowly, everyone started in my batch after two years started getting jobs in PEs and VCs, uh, private equity and venture capital funds. uh i wasn't sure if i wanted to do that so i stayed a bit longer but then i realized i was the only one so i started interviewing with them and literally i failed in three of my interviews didn't work out uh i had prepared sufficiently but didn't work out i or thought you know what why don't i bring back my boeing team uh dream and work for boeing india they said you need to oh. have a p uh without phd doesn't work unfortunately or you go to get an mba uh from the college so i think that's somewhere where it became okay if i want to do an mba let's list down the colleges i want to and some uh, you know harvard came on the map and i said let's do harvard uh, so i was looking at a couple of schools and i was actually the only one then because of this uh, i became the only one who applied after 2 years because usually people apply mm. after 3 years but since right. my came quicker so i thought why not uh, apply to hbs and then i got through and Again, a failure story okay. led to us. Yeah, it seems to be a pattern, huh? It's a pattern. <laughs> it's a pattern. Beware! But now that you know that's a pattern, it's 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 almost sort of like preemptive. But uh, you you don't know you know which direction you're going. You feel like you're chasing a success, I and it's a failure. It. And it all makes sense now. I can connect the dots. I think what Steve Jobs says, you can connect the dots, but you just don't know it at that moment. Well, actually, when you write those HBS essays, you know you're able to connect the dots because. when you write those essays you're pretty much able to make sense of any life and i do this every year for a living so uh connecting dots has now become sort of like you know a de facto skill for us uh, okay so what what happens at hps so you you sort of managed to crack hps did you apply to any other schools firstly was it i applied HBS? to stanford uh, i applied to stanford so only two schools because i was doing it after two years and i wasn't right. sure uh, didn't have time so applied to only harvard and stanford uh did not okay. get through stanford uh, got through harvard Okay, cool. All right. So, how was so, HPS? How how did it sort of <laughs> HPS? Uh, so HPS was uh, six months was super intense, and I think that a lot of people say that. And I don't know. I would love to hear about your experience, but six months was really tough. It was super cold. Yeah. It uh, the classes are intense, and everyone is in formal mode. And little do you yeah. realize, everyone else is also feeling the same. So you just feel yeah. you are running against time. uh in the bitter cold but everyone else is cracking it and you are not um uh, and uh, but slowly you start realizing like after year 1 year 2 i started realizing every what everyone else is feeling what do i want to prioritize and not and made my own friends community and after that was great uh learned few things the i think where hps helped me uh was in couple of things one uh the career switch i think uh can thank you now because one thing hps at least does to you and says if you have a dream you can achieve it if you want to yeah. be a joker you will be the best joker and they'll help you do it because they know everyone across the world and uh, so i had sat down when the career day was going to decide what i wanted to do and i'd written down a few things and i somehow nutrition health and wellness came out as a key um mm. so i just uh, I went to a career coach. I said, "Health and wellness is something I want to do. Uh, I want to do my internship in Europe. Uh, can you help?" And you wouldn't realize I got this beautiful internship in Technogym. They were sending this wow. innovation center out of Rome, uh, world class, and they wanted someone to head their digital for the summers. And I got it. Uh, wow! The visa didn't work out, so I couldn't go. But that became a reality. And I've spoken to so many people, which I 
can't imagine I could write to at that point. And people so graciously gave their time. And that just shaped my conviction that this is what I wanted to do. Yeah, um, so the, the power of the HBS brand and the networks is just... It's just it's, incredible. It's bigger than what you actually hear about. Hear about. It's incredible, especially some... And if you, you can reach out to anyone as a student. Of course, there'll be hit rate, but people would graciously give out time. I mean, you remember today, I... I was, uh, someone uh, was connecting me to Nana, actually morning I spoke to Nana Lal Kidwai. And she graciously gave out time because HBS Alam, I'll give you time and I'll she, She's endorsed my book. Nana Lal Kidwai is super generous with she's women so- who went to Harvard for sure. Because, I mean, she's been through it. She was the first female from India to go to but- HBS. So... Yeah. So I think, and you see, and I so I had this list I used to create and it was, I think that just filled my conviction that if I want to do something, I will because the power of the network has guided me and I could figure connection out. So that was one. And two uh, was how to uh, build your voice. It, yeah. uh, it's very easy where you're here as a consultant to write slides and say, this is what I think is correct. Uh, but there you have to sit in a class of 90 really smart people and make a comment and you realize that I said something, but the other guy said it and somehow everyone liked that, but not what I said. Yeah. Uh, what I thought was the only option is not the only option. So I think yeah. it tatters a lot of things, but also makes you like how to convey your point, how to convince people, how to be collaborative, which I think if you don't see it in practical, you it's just hard to learn those skills. Uh, and uh, yeah. the one which people don't, uh, I saw a lot of people regretting not doing it is the professors. I feel Harvard has the best professors that you can get. I mean, there's a network of students, but there's an also these amazing professors yeah. who uh, generously give out time, who will help you with connections, who would uh, give you all the possible help that you need to. And I had, I was, uh, after it was like a couple of months before HBS was ending and Nike was just about to start. So I asked the professor, you know, what should I do? I have some time. He said, why don't you take an internship, which takes you closer to the consumer? And yeah. I think that was a powerful advice. And uh, I ended up connecting with the Harvard India Research Center, uh, Anjali, yeah. saying that, you yeah. know, I have two ideas. I want to work with a store like Louis Vuitton. Like give me like a high-end store. I want to see how does high-end shopping happen. Or right. I want to work in a league. Tennis League was working, Pro Kabaddi was going on. Like, I right. ended up working with Future Group Pro Kabaddi. Oh, Finally, really? Okay. You know, how the league happens, how the sports, uh, apart from sure. cricket leagues, are in India. And that is just, uh, again, how it became okay. possible. Okay. So, uh, Howard, of course, many, many lessons coming for you, shaping the way you could speak, uh, shaping, obviously, your initial ideas about your career, the words health and wellness emerging in your dictionary, as a direction you want to go to. Um, let's fast forward a little bit to life at Nike and your time in the US and Shanghai. And then I want to spend obviously some uh, significant time on and be your own startup. So let's, let's jump into Nike for a little bit. So how was the experience in China? And what do you feel you know, if you had to summarize your four or five years at Nike? What were the sort of key takeaways? Uh, HBS style question right there for you, but key takeaways from Nike uh, in, in the US and Shanghai? Uh, first, uh, I, I mean, Nike is an absolutely inspiring place filled with beautiful men and women who stay fit, look lovely, wear Nike. Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone gets products at 50% discount. So, so, you know, so you fit right into Nike, huh? You're just like, I fit. I mean, we, we initially no, because I didn't grow up wearing Nikes. Uh, in India, they're so expensive, but in US, everyone does. So it took me a while actually to build my Nike wardrobe. But, uh, you know, everyone is so fit. They love the brand. They love what they do. And I think Nike taught me the power of culture. There is no, I mean, there are very, very few companies of that size who have such strong um, culture of sports, health and wellness. And if you go in their meetings, it never felt like they were working for Nike. It felt like they were working for their own brand. It was always like, I can't let it happen. I can't do it. So I think that's just incredibly powerful. So your Uh, culture, you're saying how to build this sort of, culture around your brand and How the they, sort of sense of ownership. Yeah, and what they did to the ownership. Second, I especially learned uh, collaboration because Nike is uh, started with a team, team of runners, yeah. team of footballers. So everything happens yeah. with consensus building. Uh, you have to learn how to do that. Uh, so huge exercise learned it. 
China was incredibly fascinating. Uh, when I was there, uh, it's very first a very closed ecosystem with no Google, no WhatsApp, but uh, amazing uh, digital industry and how it's booming. So uh, just love to see how um, Nike was setting up their business in China and US. So huge. Okay, okay. So uh, in amazing global exposure, amazing sort of domestic India exposure, BCG base with consulting. Then you got the sort of Nike experience with health and wellness, working with obviously a world-class brand like Nike. Um, and you gave it all away to start your own company. Um, as an entrepreneur, I can sort of just tap you on the shoulder and say, I sympathize with you. But how did that happen for you? What, what made you sort of, you know, just it, for, all, for all of us, it's been that sort of like, I'm just going to pull the plug now and sleep. Your uh, video disconnect. What made me do it? Is, am, am I visible now? Yeah, what yeah, made yeah. you do it? Yes. Um, I, since I figured out that uh, I wanted to do health and wellness at HBS, I knew I wanted to start up of my own. I think because it became this calling from inside that I just need to go and promote health and wellness. It was always there. Um, I wanted to gain an international experience before I started. So hence Nike fortunately happened and then took me to China. But that uh, desire was there. Uh, so after seven years abroad, I thought now is the time. Let's come back. And uh, I took my time to just research the space, see who all are out there. And uh, zero day on women's health, uh, largely because of how the nature of uh, the extent of underserved uh, it is in India and globally. And the lack of products, the lack of services. And that again, as you, you, you might call it challenge again, uh, you might call it... Uh, the D you know, word just, emerges in your life. Yeah, it's like, who else would do it? I think that somewhere right. that began the calling. I'm someone who's interested in health and wellness. I have international experience. I have everything. I can get the network. So why shouldn't I be the one helping it out? So uh, my co-founder, actually, Ankur, he started the company. I joined him um, last year when I came back to India. And uh, the and, and how do you meet a co-founder for 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 you know people listening and people who want to be entrepreneurs? How do you even find a co-founder? Co-founder, like what was your journey like? Yeah, I mean, my uh, how he found so how he found me actually in this case was he okay, actually. Sorry. So you're like, yeah. oh, let me correct you. He <laughs> found like, me. <laughs> okay, sure. Okay. So how yeah. did he, how did he find you? So he had actually interviewed a lot of people. Uh, he says that he's interviewed 100 people before he spoke to me. Uh, but uh, he, so I had seen the product on and it intrigued me. Uh, then I wrote to him on LinkedIn and uh, I, he, he and he responded to it and he and I chatted. Uh, we met at Third Wave Coffee and we spoke for five hours. Then we so met he, a couple of he times. Is, essentially, he found you on, you on LinkedIn. That, that was his connect. Yeah, yeah. I had written to him. Uh, I had seen the product, so I wrote to him, just like, you I know, see. love what you're doing uh, and let's chat. And that wasn't even like a con co-founder chat. I was just interested in the industry. Uh, we spoke for three times and he said, I have a co-founder role. Uh, do you want it? Okay. Okay. So you reached out to him via LinkedIn and then sort of that the conversation sort of spurred from there. Okay. All right. I'm yeah. just going to take yeah. one or two questions here. Uh, I am foodie guy. My question, please. I'm so sorry. I'm foodie guy. If you can just tell me specifically what kind of tips you're looking for. Uh, I'm not sure what sort of tips you want for the next four years. We don't know what stage you're at right now. Are you 20, 30, 40, 50? No, you I think he had light? the question. He said he's from IIT Delhi, first year mechanical. I was just scrolling up. And he says some tips for next four years. Okay, Shaita, you want to take it? Any tips for him since he's a college student? <laughs> I would just say, uh, I mean, one, enjoy. Um, I feel I'm here like right now, IITs have just become very rigorous. It's all about first year internship, second year internship, third year internships. I would uh, spend some time focusing on uh, just develop an aspect of you, which you would like to try a lot of things, develop an aspect, make life lasting relationships and uh, just let your creatively flow. I think let these four years be, you don't have to decide everything. That's my advice. But I think I'm old to advise on IIT now. <laughs> All like, right. So I'm foodie guy. Let it flow. Uh, Going to take another question here from Uf, Uf Mirchi who says, how did you arrive at the brand name? Okay. Yeah. Let's do that. Let's talk a little bit about, you know, branding. How important is the a brand name? Um, and how did you guys come up with the name? 
Yeah, so the name is actually super interesting. So the uh, the idea behind it is when we looked at the state of women's health, we uh, the two the insights we found out was one, uh, women were not really so awareness of health is not as much, and as a woman specifically, they're not able to care about their health because it's always about her role as a mother, as a daughter, as a um, wife. And it was always an ad. I have to also think about him. I have to also think about them. We said, what if it could be about me? So you don't have to make a choice about my health or my husband, my health or my career. Mm -hmm. Let it be and me. And with oh. and products, you wouldn't have to make that choice. You could actually very satisfactory sit in your couch and at the end of the day be relieved that you took care of me with everything. Oh. And we make it convenient. We make it as healthy. You make it as effective that uh, we would take that choice away from you. Oh, okay. That's a great story. Oh, 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 I'm so glad you asked that question. It's a beautiful story. Uh, and I, I love that it's not, you know, or me. It's just an and me. So you and still want to play all those roles in your life. And then you say, okay, I'm also going to be part of the ecosystem I take care of and nurture. Oh, that's beautiful. Okay. Wow. All right. So that, that's the story behind the name. Uh, can we talk a little bit about the product itself? Like, so what does the product range look like? Um, how did you develop it? I was reading on the website that it's all natural products, etc. So, so just shed some light on the product range and the philosophy behind the products. Yeah. So when we started uh, three years ago, uh, we actually took a year to launch our first range of products. So September 2017 was when the product company started and September 2018 is when the first products came. And it came up because it took so long because there was no other product we could compare with. We couldn't do a copycat product. We wanted to figure out what format, what ingredient, and most importantly, what problem do we go ahead and solve first. So we spoke to a ton of women um, and uh, zeroed in on two problems. They said, period. Period pain, can you solve for it? Acne, can you solve for it? So those were the first two products. Our so, philosophy, so it's menstrual issues and, and acne. Those are the two acne. Big, biggest so the first issues you thing, yeah, they start, we, those are the first two products we launched with. The philosophy behind the so, product... So is, when you say you spoke to a lot of women, is this sort of, you know, in-house surveys? Did you hire a research company? Like, how does one go about sort of even figuring out the consumer? So we uh, spoke to a lot of our own network, friends and family, and then reached out. And then we had worked with Elephant Design. Uh, they... Okay. Uh, to help with the entire brand philosophy. So they also help them speak to consumers. Uh, but it was all like surveys, Facebook groups, connecting with them. I mean, having a page, then connecting and developing it. So we spoke to like 500 plus women by doing this. Oh, but okay. Also, like it, we, I mean, we also took a year. So we spoke to a lot of women in the process. Um, okay. And the philosophy behind it was... Uh, one, the product has to be natural. Uh, we didn't want any artificial ingredients because... It, as a fundamental company, if you are in food, uh, we know that anything artificial does impact your body in some shape or form. So we said no sure. negative, it's all artificial. Uh, the second was it has to be effective. Uh, so we wanted someone who going to say, like, didn't just take calcium, just take vitamin K. But let's figure out a formulation that we can prove that it works and it works for you. So we'll make it problem solution versus a generic powder or a pill which uh, is usually preventive. And the third one, uh, we said it, uh, we, com we used a combination of Ayurveda and nutrition science. And that's actually very interesting. Uh, so the philosophy is that, of course, if you look at health and most of the issues, um, your hormones need micronutrients, vitamins and minerals. So in the first case, you need to have it. But these days, because of the lifestyles that we're leading and with the stress that we have, a lot of what we consume, honestly, sometimes doesn't get absorbed in the body. Because the body is just in stress and the pH balance. Sure. Ayurvedic herbs are absolutely amazing in how they let create the right environment so that nutrients can be absorbed. absorbed and health right. of Ayurveda and nutrition together, I think has been working really well in driving further effectiveness of the products. Okay. So that was the philosophy. We started with these two products. Uh, and since then, now we have a range of nine products. Uh, for PCOS. So, for so when you say you started with two products, you, you, you talked about the two areas, right? It was menstrual and it was acne. So within each of these, you had one product each? To start no, with? we actually, we, the initial philosophy was always to start uh, to look at women's health across her life stages of menstruation, pregnancy and menopause. So that okay. was the very beginning. Uh, 40 years of life, three life stages. 
and within that we saw multiple problems the two problems we start solved for was period during period care and uh, acne that happens due to hormonal changes okay do you have any of your product around by any chance like would you be able to I actually, yeah i feel this very interesting uh, uh it is altered but it's called period chocolates super interesting products uh, that we launched uh, so after we launched our period drinks uh women we spoke to a lot of women and you know what do you have during periods they said so much mood swings and cravings happen that i consume a lot of chocolates during that time the problem with market chocolates we found out is that there's so much sugar that it just crashes your blood sugar just and it's unhealthy because of all it is so so i decided we we'll make a we'll make a no sugar dark chocolate and we'll add all the herbs micronutrients in it which would help with your periods so it's, it's super interesting super i mean the insight has come from the consumer and they come so, in small bites I, 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 i just want to get this right so if if i have my period and if i'm going through some sort of uh, mood swing or sort of hormonal switch how is drinking your drink or eating that chocolate going to help me i i don't get it so can you can you sort of yeah. break it down for yeah. me for example let's take a uh, period mood swings now when you are on your periods it's uh, your serotonin it's proven because your estrogen we all know that your periods happen because of changes in estrogen levels estrogen levels trigger sure. the ovary to produce eggs and release it now due to these changes in estrogen levels especially during periods estrogen is connected because all the hormones are connected so if estrogen goes down then there is this hormone in the uh, which is secreted by pituitary gland which is called serotonin those levels go okay. down Now, serotonin okay. is happy hormone. Now, if your serotonin goes down, you become we become tired. Uh, so we become I see. Angry, um, uh, moody. We don't want. We become cranky. Sure. Uh, our uh, we also it is and when you become sad, what do you do? You want to take happy things. In food, sure. we and connected to mind. So you start craving salt and sweet. Okay. So you are chocolates. You are craving for uh, chips during that time. Sure. now if you start having sugar then your blood sugar goes up and crashes you feel more mm-hmm. anxious but it hasn't really uh, solved anything magnesium okay. is no is serotonin so if you have enough magnesium in your body then your serotonin levels could be balanced so and we talk about so, so and it says is, oh, is, that's done. what you're doing that is that what you're doing you're sort of adding that so sort of chemical add, component add magnesium. so magnesium goes in and tells cells serotonin don't worry and there i see and then so it's good you feel uh, more calmer you feel cravings are reduced and it works and we of course sweeten it with stevia so that you know some part of your brain or uh, gets uh, that sugar some, fix as well it you get that sugar fix I so see. that's one. okay yeah okay Similar. very interesting i'm just going to pick up a question here uh, pertaining to what you're talking about from chris ann who says along with consuming your products do you need to also follow a balanced diet um especially for the problem of acne ah oh, good question so is is there some sort of balance that you recommend or some sort of nutrition plan that supplements these products yeah so i have this so i have because now we are i mean i'm a health and wellness so speak to a lot of people i figure out that it's always good uh, because it's always hard for people to take things out of their life i don't sure. want to i mean i love having i don't want to want to take coffee i don't want to i don't want to stop this right yeah and i usually say add good things and the more good things you'll add you will automatically start realizing that the bad things would have to go out so i uh, so with our drinks of course uh, the skin drinks specifically is designed such that it would detox your blood it would hydrate sure. your scales uh, use pigmentation and it's good in itself now of course if you're having tons of chips and all the garbage that we all know and i think we all know what that garbage is then sure. of course it would to so impact um but if you are including this drink in your regular diet with of course a couple of days of binge here and there the drink is good in itself we of course recommend cleanse your face uh, eat lots of fruits and vegetables etc but that is okay. like your normal diet okay and uh, you know we are, i'm going to pick take a question here from sharon since uh, i i'm going to take sharon's question as a sort of you know overall just talk to you a little bit about uh you know how do you build a team this this is a relatively new company right um and you went from nike is large sort of mammoth organization to a startup 
um, what is it like building a team? How, you know, what is the current team structure like? And what are the, some of the challenges you're facing in India as you're building up this team? And to, then to take Sharon's specific question, uh, what kind of educational backgrounds are majority of the employees at and me from? So let's, let's just jump in. Let's touch upon that sort of HR and, you know, that, that's a piece of, of your life. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's, I mean, it's super interesting to ask someone who is like a pre-series, a very small company with low funds and you are running to prove the market fit. You have not enough resources to just like spend as much money into what each candidate asks for. So, of course, I, uh, I mean, having a good team is really important and building it for the future is very important. Most often we as founders and I would I'm guilty of that. We don't spend enough time on it. We are always solving for tomorrow, uh, for today right. versus solving for tomorrow. Um, what I figured out, uh, I think this is a lesson I learned from Nike is uh, so if you look at Nike's history, of course, Phil Knight came from Stanford, but uh, the rest of Nike was found out by just passionate people. And sure. up till now, because it's located in the small town called Portland, not too many fancy people go sure. there, but it's filled with passionate people. So that's one thing I try to take it here. That, so you know, were you in Portland, Oregon? I was in Portland, Oregon. Oh, wow. Okay, fine. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so, I, so one thing I take it here is you find people who are passionate about this space. Uh, so that's number one. And I, in the interview, I try to stress that. Uh, of course, I try to get people who, are, who have slight information, uh, slight understanding of the uh, work that they would do, but can be have a desire to improve and mentor so that it could be molded. So that's two. Um, I... It's it's easier said than done, to be quite honest, because uh, it uh, you you just can't know a person uh, till they join the team, and you right. have to figure out and tricks of figuring it out in the interview set of how that person would be later. Um, and uh, I think it's uh, more so difficult in India versus abroad. Is uh, in India we so uh, in our resumes are about big schools, big colleges. I did X Y Z, and sometimes that does translate into the skills that I would need for a startup. Uh, sure. So we've struggled, we've failed, we've learned. Um, to his specific question, uh, of course, me and my co-founder have uh, a strong traditional backgrounds of IIT Bombay. Stan uh, I'm from IIT Bombay and Harvard. He's from IIT Delhi and Stanford. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, and the rest of the team has is a mix. Uh, we uh, hire from uh, local colleges. It's very young. First of all, I mean, the average age is 26 years. So super okay. young people, passionate people. Uh, okay. Across. All right. Uh, I hope, Sharon, that took care of your question. Um, of course, the founders seem to be super highly educated. But in terms of the team, I think the, the education background she's looking for uh, starts with the letter P. She's just looking for passion. Um, Charming Desert Rose. What was your core in IIT? Uh, she mentioned Chami Desert. She's an aerospace engineer. Okay. All right. Um, I, I, I want to also understand, you know, um, when, when you're building sort of a consumer product company, what are the different things that are, you know, that what, what's on your plate? You know, um, from obviously a conventional business perspective, we say, okay, it's obviously product, right? like all the four P's of marketing, et cetera. But in reality, what's on your plate? You know, when you wake up every morning, what, what are you confronted with? What's your everyday reality? Yeah. Uh, the first one is uh, consumer. Uh, I obsess on consumer. Uh, what kind of feedback we are getting. We try to speak to 200 consumers a day. Uh, we built an in-house reality. So the first thing I do is check all the consumer emails and I check it myself. Uh, look at what's happening on Instagram, social media. And, and sometimes those are just feedback. Sometimes those are negative comments. Sometimes those are learning and product ideas. And try to speak to people. So I think that's number one and takes up the first half of first, uh, you know, first couple of hours of the day. Uh, then it becomes brand. Uh, I think how do I keep taking the ideas of how to communicate better? Because still women's health, there are not so many products out there. People are still not used to products like PCOS, UTI, period written on them. So how <laughs> do I best market to them? And I don't have big brand budgets. So what creative tips, tricks I can use? Um, I look at what people are doing in US and India across like similar industries and just chart out some ideas and keep looking at our campaigns. Uh, third is product ideas. We do spend a lot of time in uh, product testing. Uh, during COVID, actually, half the team was still here because we had an in-house team. So new ideas, tastes, flavors, formats, uh, 
we have a pipeline going on for the next six months. Uh, then is growth. How do we uh, wow. grow, you know, build the business uh, across each platforms? What should be the strategy? Where should we focus our money? Um, when should we invest? Divest. And uh, lastly, is investors. How uh, next round of funding and who should we reach out to? Building those connections. And, okay, so uh, since you've touched touched upon investing, because that was going to be the next theme I was going to pick up on. Tell us a bit about the the you know were you part of the Series A or did Uncle do that? And um, you know how how does the fundraising process happen? And what you know what 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 are you looking at now? You I think you already uh, you you've done the Series A or pre Series A? Oh, okay, pre Series A. Uh, we okay. have done. The initial seed that happened three years ago. Then we did a bridge round uh, when I was there last year uh, in December, and we'll be going out for Series A. Uh, I what this there's some things that the investors look for. There's something that we uh, look for. Uh, what uh, I think to your specific question, uh, you always want someone who understands the space, especially something that we are doing. We want people who understands consumer, who understands what it takes to build this category, and we've been fortunate to have uh, people like um, those on um, our platform. But uh, it's not that easy. Women's health is still very taboo. You find a handpicked of a handful of people across, and uh, we. I think that to me, that's the most. And how much you can gel with the person because you have to deal with ups and downs. COVID happened. Business went down. Now sure. sometimes problems start business went down. So you want someone who can understand. The ups and downs, and has seen that versus uh, you being scared to tell the person what happens. Okay, so you you want an investor who's sort of you know grounded in reality, and uh, obviously someone who understands the space, etc., so that they're able to help you. Okay, I'm going to pick up a question from Charming Desert Rose. Is it okay to approach prospective employers via LinkedIn? Yes, of course, Charming Desert Rose. Uh, Shita shared her story. She met Uncle through uh, LinkedIn, and of course, LinkedIn's whole philosophy is to do that. So, if you're looking at a certain job, please do go ahead and uh, connect with your prospective employer through LinkedIn. Krutika Saraya says, "Recently received protein powder. I'm presuming she uh, that's one of your products. Hope it works as promised. What's your <laughs> brand promise, Shweta? What's your brand promise, and uh, is, are you are you guys keeping your brand promise alive?" We, I, so we, uh, so uh, yeah, I forget, forget her name. Uh, Kritika, she, Kritika. Kritika. So we do. We so now with every product, uh, you should be receiving a call from a dietitian because we want to be with yeah. a, your journey. So she would advise you on how to integrate it in your life. Any questions that you might have, plus she'll track your journey for the next three six months. Because we sometimes what we realize, I think someone did ask, you take a product and it doesn't work uh, because you might have something else or your diet might be missing. So now, along with the product, we would be making sure that whatever goal you have from across our product portfolio, lifestyle changes that we can give you, we'll help you. Okay, so a nutritionist is going to is is part of the product offering now. Yeah, it's a it's a you get free uh, diet consultation plus you get a tracker and she uh, it's right now and uh, yeah she tracks your uh, journey. Okay, so it's like a virtual assistant of sorts. She's a real person, uh, so she'll talk to you and she'll answer all the questions. And after that, she'll fill those questions in tracker, and then she'll call okay. you in to just check up on you. Okay, uh, let's touch a little bit about your distribution. You know, uh, I know you're selling through these websites. Uh, you're selling through your own website. Uh, you know, how how obviously you know once you have product distribution, then becomes uh, sort of key in your journey. What how how are you planning to sort of pervade the market with this product? Yeah, we uh, we side of we thought of pervading it with offline first. We're actually present in five hundred stores. Uh, oh, that we, <laughs> we were. We realized that with the nature of the product, uh, women weren't very uh, accustomed to seeing it on the shelves, and they weren't okay to talk about it, learn more about it. So we right. actually let go of an entire sales team and shut the entire offline to actually pivot online. And now the strategy is uh, additional is where you can easily explore a product. You can learn. You can read reviews. You can chat with my team, and uh, you know, figure out what test product you need to have, etc. Um, now our uh, strategy is lead with digital content and commerce um, for the foreseeable future. Next couple of years, it would be a digital play because we see. I mean, there's huge potential in digital. Plus, uh, uh, we can do a lot more in terms of content, be it YouTube, blogs, um, and also with respect to products. So that's going to be. Uh, through our own website and plus uh, Amazon, Big Basket, Nike. 
Okay, great. All right, Shara, since we're running out of time, I uh, just wanted, you know, take your sort of final tips on, uh, on, on, the, on entrepreneurship. You know, it's uh, obviously still relatively new for you. So, um, you know, I don't, I, sometimes you get this superlative view on entrepreneurship with someone who's already, you know, put millions in the bank or you get someone who's super jaded. Uh, fortunately for you, you know, this is still, still fresh and exciting. So, you know, just early impressions of entrepreneurship and how, how, is, it, how is it like? What, what is it like for someone? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't lie, it's hard. Uh, no matter how much I felt that I was on the grounds person, it is hard because uh, even like, the, and this is me speaking as a co-founder, I have a team of 20, but you still have to go to the absolute nitty gritties. Uh, and there are honestly ups and downs. I don't know what tomorrow is going to be like. So the one thing that I try to advise people is, uh, you know, you we try to get to starting up thinking about the exciting things that we'll get to build. Uh, but I think we need to know what are we okay with the risk and the downside. And I think that should drive your decision. If you are okay with sometimes falling, if you're okay with this not working out and how okay you are with it, then you will sail through because now I know that I'm okay with the worst and I know what time I'm giving it and I'll do all my best uh, to do it. And that makes all the negatives okay. Um, okay. And you Okay, guys, you uh, heard it from Sheta. And Sheta, I think, uh, you know, as, as you described early on in the show, you've been through uh, several failures and managed to make those into superlative successes. And uh, we from Reach IV wish you all the very best. And I have no doubt that you're going to take any small failure from this and make sure uh, you, you turn that uh, D into an A+. plus. So good, good luck to you and uh, pleasure having you on the show, Sheta. And do keep us posted on your journey. And I'm absolutely... Uh, in awe of all that you have done. And uh, I'm only going to be tracking your career for the next five years and 10 years. And I can see a big success coming out of this. So congratulations and uh, wish you all the best. Thank you so much, Riva. Thank you so much. It was absolutely wonderful talking to you uh, and everyone who was there during the session. Thank you so much. Have a lovely, Thank you. lovely rest of the Bye. week. Bye, Sheta. Thank you. Bye. Uh, thank you guys for watching. Thanks, Vamsi. Uh, awesome session. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Chocolate Beer and Love. Uh, thank you all for watching. That marks the end of episode 33. And we'll look forward to uh, episode 34 next week. Um, thank you, Sharon, for those questions and comments. And I think, Sharon, you were asking something that I could quickly touch upon. If you just DM me, Sharon and Charming Desert Rose, I uh, would be happy to connect. Guys, do follow Sheta uh, on and me on the Insta link. And I will be back next week with yet another interesting guest. Thank you so much for watching.